Okay, so guys, uh, today's Friday talk is, uh, um, is our guest is uh, Nicolò from Micron. And uh, uh, I will uh, uh, instantly leave you the stage, Nicolò. So uh, if you want to share the screen, you should be sure. able to share the screen. Tell me if uh, the slides are visible. Yes. Okay. I want to put you on evidence. Okay. And okay. now you can go. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. So let me briefly present myself for uh, uh, some of you already uh, heard uh, me in the um, uh, Cybersecurity Academy. For those who did not, uh, um, I am a product security engineer in Micron. I work in the uh, red team penetration testing. Um, and uh, basically, what I do is, uh, I mean, what I do in detail, we will see throughout this presentation more or less, but uh, uh, in the large, let's say that uh, I work uh, to secure um, uh, the products of this company. And in practice, uh, I try to demonstrate um, state-of-the-art attacks, uh, uh, physical attacks, software attacks uh, on uh, the, device, the devices of this company. So let me begin uh, with uh, just a, a brief introduction about Micron because this company, even though it's pretty big, uh, it's not really known um, to the public, uh, mainly because uh, um, the customer of Micron are uh, OEMs, so are companies that produce devices for the end user. So even though most of you, if uh, you have, uh, let's say, an iPhone in your hand, you are uh, uh, you have a Micron memory inside your hand, uh, more than one, most likely. Uh, you maybe this is the first time you hear about this company. So um, Micron, the Let's say the most important thing to be said is the only uh, memory manufacturer that is uh, based uh, in the in the West. So all the others are uh, uh, Asian based, uh, and uh, Micron was founded uh, 45 years ago, and um, uh, its headquarters is in Boise, which is a small town. Uh, um, that is, was mostly agricultural unless uh, Micron was founded and then uh, uh, the site there is, is uh, simply huge. Uh, we are also building, uh, we are growing it. Uh, there is a fab there, a research and development fab, so a silicon foundry there, basically. And um, uh, it has a pretty large revenue, oh, $15 billion, uh, and it operates in 17 countries. So uh, the Micron really is a global team um, that is spread all over the world. We have uh, um, functions that are uh, basically divided in various uh, locations in the world from, uh, uh, there, there is a site in Italy, in Vimercate, very close to Politecnico. There are other sites in Europe. Uh, there is the headquarter and other sites in the US. Uh, and we have also uh, production sites in Asia. Um, Micron, uh, since it's a mm, semiconductor company, it uh, it's, let's say, uh, its richness comes from the fact that uh, uh, from intellectual property, because uh, um, the point is that when you make, let's say, a um, light bulb, anybody can make a light bulb. So the only way where you can sell your light bulb if you make it cost, let's say, less than others. While if you make, if you make silicon tech, then uh, you are creating something that uh, is so difficult in its making. It's so cutting edge because, for example, we heard about the latest nanometer processes, the latest lithography, it's like six nanometers. So you have a transistor which has a width of six nanometer. This, this feature size is so small that just to make the device actually work, you need very a lot of engineering. You need a lot of engineering effort. and. Um, the way in which uh, this company is able to build memories that work, uh, it's what makes uh, uh, really Micron unique. So unfortunately, not anybody can make their own silicon lab in their basement. But uh, um, so just uh, 
to go over briefly. Uh, I I am a technician, not a businessman, so I will just tell you about the fact that the uh, we operate in the memory market so the memory market uh, is shaped more or less like this there is uh, uh, the vast majority of it like 70 percent of our revenue comes from dram and uh, uh, 27 percent comes from nand so even though dram is uh, like one of the oldest form of it's been around since uh, basically since the inception the first micron product was actually a DRAM and we are still manufacturing those because we haven't come up with a technology that uh, has the same performance and the same cost and the same reliability yet so we are still um, manufacturing lots of DRAM and uh, um, also, DRAM and NAND, uh, let's say, are two ways of distinguishing our products uh, according to the technology. However, uh, even though they are the same technology, these two kinds of devices get packaged into a uh, form factor that uh, uh, in the end are assembled in uh, a mobile phone or a car or a server. In fact, we are uh, operating on four main uh, basically businesses, uh, the computer networking, which uh, um, basically uh, consider all the data center environment uh, um, and uh, as well as the network devices. Uh, we have the mobile business unit. So we, we for a mobile device, for a mobile phone, uh, you get DRAM and NAND are packaged in very small packages that can, uh, um, be compatible with the size of a phone, uh, which is, you know, has, have, uh, if you ever saw an X-ray of a phone or if you ever uh, disassembled a phone yourself, you would notice that there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's very little empty space in a phone. So you cannot afford to have a very big dim stick lying inside your phone. Um, we have the embedded business unit that includes the automotive and industrial uh, um, applications. And we have the storage business unit that uh, basically uh, it considers uh, uh, all the data that is, for example, uh, 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 the products that end up in a data center, for example, enterprises as these that need to be to have a capacity since in a, in a, in a data center, um, you are, I mean, not in the same way of a mobile phone, but you are also limited by space because uh, every rack unit that you uh, occupy creates more, occupies more real estate, requires a separate cooling process. So um, uh, data center operators are interested in achieving high density devices because uh, they, it might be uh, an opportunity for them to cut costs. This is why, for example, we are able to manufacture SSDs which have uh, nine, more than 900 terabytes of storage in a single drive that is the size smaller than my, my mobile phone. So this is really hard to, to imagine that the amount of data that you can store, but you just uh, have to stick a lot of uh, NANDs inside. <laughs> I'm making it easy, but obviously it's uh, much more complex than this. So um, the main ca categories of products uh, that uh, Micron uh, uh, operates on and Micron produces basically are, uh, so we, we divide, we have uh, on the left uh, memory devices and on the right we have storage devices. So memory are mostly DRAM based. And uh, we have uh, something like a graphics and ultra bandwidth solution. So GD the GDDR5X uh, uh, that is in your PS5, if you have one, or the HBM, which is a, um, a very cutting edge technology that basically has, uh, it's used for high performance computing. So it's used in uh, uh, um, data centers that are tuned for uh, uh, performance computation and you get uh, uh, your uh, silicon processor that is stacked with the uh, DRAM controller and stacked on top of the DRAM controller, you have several uh, dies of uh, DRAM. So uh, this is a, uh, uh, can achieve uh, very high throughput because um, 
all the data travels through a very short distance so you can push uh, the frequencies uh, of the link and you can exchange data faster than you could on a DRAM stick. Uh, then there's uh, the other DRAM, basically the DDR5, DDR6 uh, sticks, also DDR4 are still uh, manufactured. And um, then uh, you have uh, the storage size, uh, which mostly is uh, solid state drives uh, that uh, uh, most of you probably are familiar with. Uh, they can be the consumer level products, they can be the enterprise level products. Uh, the difference is mostly in uh, uh, the quality of the component and, for example, the performance, uh, um, because uh, for a traditional let's say for a consumer product uh, you have a single user typically while well, when you ship to a device to a data center uh, it mostly gets uh, uh, loaded into a server that maybe hosts uh, thousands of virtual machines so you you get that the demand for memory bandwidth uh, scales uh, and is uh, far higher in a data center. And then we have also uh, raw flash, raw NANDs basically. So sometimes our customer uh, do not want to have a device in which you can directly issue block reads and block writes, but maybe they want just the raw NAND. Typically this is done in um, either uh, in uh, uh, applications where uh, uh, the OEM wants to have the complete control of the NAND. For example, in iPhones, you have uh, a memory controller that uh, is uh, designed by Apple and then they use NANDs, uh, raw NANDs, and they are able to get a, a very, uh, a huge performance because they control everything or when they want to cut costs for example in in routers uh, most uh, uh, often when you open up a router you find a own end inside so that's because uh, the own end is cheaper than a managed end so an end that can expose a block device and uh, in that case usually the uh, what is called the flash translation layer so the conversion from uh, uh, raw and blocks to something that is a block device is done in software in the Linux kernel. Uh, we have also some uh, products that are in between the two categories. Uh, uh, those are called the UMCP and they are special packages designed for mobile applications or so for smartphones that include an end and a DRAM for more uh, convenient uh, packaging. As I said, uh, uh, there are several sites uh, uh, all across the world. Uh, this is uh, an advantage when when uh, uh, working at Micron because uh, uh, on one side it allows you to uh, basically uh, interact with people belonging to different cultures and this is uh, uh, can make you uh, grow also personally because you are interacting with different cultures so you are le learning something about the world just by working which is nice but also uh, it's also an opportunity because uh, uh, it might be the case that uh, you when you are interacting with some uh, people that are in another site, you sometimes you need to go to travel to that site. And uh, especially when, uh, uh, I mean, uh, at, at the first years of the career, uh, it's exciting to go on a business travel and uh, also it's a great opportunity. So um, talking about uh, what, so, as I already said, I am in the product security team, but uh, what uh, creates, let's say, what, what characteristics uh, should uh, a good candidate for our product security team have? So working in a product security team, uh, it's not easy for a company that manufactures hardware, not only us, but uh, all the company that creates hardware. That's because, uh, if you want to secure a, a product, uh, you need to have uh, knowledge, uh, a knowledge that basically spans from firmware knowledge to software knowledge to hardware knowledge. And um, I'm differentiating firmware and software because I, I mean for software, let's say higher level development and for firmware, let's say more lower level development. And you need to know all of these three areas, I mean, you do not 
need to be an expert in these three areas because this is simply impossible. There's not enough life to become an expert in those three areas, especially, you know, after when one is studying at the university. However, you need to have uh, maybe one main competence, but a broader understanding of what you're doing and how it interacts with maybe. Maybe one is an expert on firmware, but still knows what happens in the above layer, what knows what happens below him or, or uh, vice versa for the other characteristics. Uh, that's because uh, when you're working on a product, uh, the, the security of the product has implication that span these three characteristics. Basically, you might have a vulnerability that stems from the hardware and that you maybe, uh, maybe has a consequence on the firmware. Maybe you can act on the firmware to mitigate it because changing the hardware is more costly. Or maybe you have a, um, a problem that, for example, can be caused by higher level software, for example, uh, let's say a, a cache attack. A cache attack is uh, something you typically implement uh, in a very high level because uh, um, it's very hard to hide the latency of the cache because uh, if a cache has constant latency, that means it's not a cache. That means it has the size of the memory it wants to mirror. So uh, a cache will always have a latency. This means that in a system, you will always uh, have the side channel, the timing side channel of the cache that tells you whether an address was recently used or not. So something like that is even visible in the upper layer, let's say. Um, uh, when you are writing software uh, and running on, on Lean, under Linux, uh, uh, you would notice if you measure the latency of memory access, you would notice that there's a cache underneath. And however, the cache itself, uh, it's a hardware mechanism. So to fully exploit uh, a cache attacks, for example, to, um, to steal data, you need to understand, you need to sometimes reverse engineer how the cache works. And Therefore, you need to have knowledge of the hardware, even though you work from a software perspective. And um, now, even though it's hard to get uh, uh, all the knowledge that it's required to work in Micron in the university, that's not even something we expect. Um, my recommendation would be to to be curious and to uh, to know at least a little bit about all the complete list system, to never uh, isolate your view only on a single uh, component of what you're doing, because uh, um, otherwise you miss uh, some of these uh, peculiar interaction, which are in the end sometimes what makes a system secure or not. So let me go over a bit in detail about uh, uh, basically uh, the, our products and what, are, uh, what let's say, uh, let's review some examples of what could it mean to secure uh, all of these different products. So we are seeing uh, uh, day after day, uh, basically a growth in the way in the artificial intelligence, in the way it is used, in the way, uh, in the capabilities that is, it is achieving. And um, uh, this, uh, however, um, is, does not come for free because uh, uh, as you might be aware, the large language model, for example, GPT-3, 4, um, they require a lot of computational power, especially for the training of the model, but also to uh, to run, to execute the module. If you try to run uh, uh, LLAMA2 or uh, some other open source large language model on your own laptop, you maybe have noticed how slow it runs because uh, um, artificial intelligence implementation, when they are performed in software, so when they use traditional CPUs, they are very resource intensive. And um, um, especially when, if we want to do, let's say right now, we, maybe some of all of you tried ChatGPT, 
but it would be nice, for example, to have uh, not something centralized like ChatGPT, but maybe something that resides on your device, on your personal device, like your smartphone, and never leaves your device. Because um, we really don't want some third-party data company to uh, mine knowledge from the way you train their model, right? We would want to have, for example, especially if we use these models in, in our life, we don't want uh, uh, some company to benefit, you know, from uh, mining data from our personal life. So at some point, uh, these models are going to be moved inside our devices also in the training phase to, you know, to be trained on your life. And to do this, uh, if you want to, you know, perform such a training and still have uh, your uh, uh, phone battery lasting at least one day, we need to change the way in which data is managed inside the device. Uh, for example, now data is processed only by the CPU while it's residing in the main memory. So when you want to perform any operation on the data, you need to take data from the NAND, you need to copy to the RAM using uh, uh, some sort of a mechanism like DMA that travels through the UFS link of the device. And then you need to operate on the data while it is in RAM. And then uh, at some point, uh, since the, the model is big, you need to store it back in the NAND. So all of these may be and the operation you did is just uh, a sum and multiply, because in the end, uh, this, uh, uh, the artificial intelligence model, uh, the underlying math that they use is just is usually very simple. It's just convolution of matrices. Uh, it's just uh, 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 sums and multiplication. So not uh, uh, something sophisticated in mathematical terms or in computation term. So. It would be nice, for example, if we could move uh, the, the computational power to the memory. This is some of the challenges we are, we are facing in the future when we want to uh, make artificial intelligence computation more efficient. Um, but until now, what, it, what will happen until we reach, let's say, this stage where we are able to efficiently compute uh, um, on our devices, uh, uh, the training of a model, we will have, uh, um, we will rely on model hosted on data centers. So for that, uh, we need uh, a strong connectivity and uh, we need uh, to be able to move and store data uh, fastly because in the end, uh, uh, what matters uh, is the delay, the latency we get when we use our device. If our device replies in more than 500 milliseconds, we perceive it as slow and we are frustrated by that. So if we want to uh, create a device that really can uh, fulfill our needs, we need to be fast in our storage. However, what's the matter of security with all of this? If we are training a device, for example, if we are training a model with the data from our personal life, this means that a lot of information about our personal life, even more than it is today, will, will move inside our smartphone, for example, or a data center, for example, if we are using a language model of a third party company. This means that we, we get some high stakes so some let's say uh, an, some third party might be interested in stealing that data for example uh, a third party might want to right now we are seeing a race to artificial intelligence where the company that possesses the best model uh, basically can uh, uh, dominate the other companies just because uh, uh, you need a good model to have a, a functional AI. It's not only, let's say, the, uh, the algorithm, you need also to train it very well. So there are estimates in that uh, AI model could be worth something like uh, uh, $10 million, a single model. So you get that an amount of data, I mean, in since the inception of computer security, it was credit cards. The smallest bit of information where you can get the most money out of that. However, 
this AI uh, uh, revolution basically is creating, is accumulating value in these models and an attacker might be interested to steal these models. Now, um, if, in a system, if the models are stored in the storage, it might be the case where the storage is trusted by the device. For example, for performance reason, Sometimes uh, you, uh, uh, I mean, you can make use of uh, a so-called self-encrypting drive, which is an SSD in which um, you put the data, and the disk, the the SSD encrypts it itself. So it, it receives the data in plain text, and it encrypts it and stores it encrypted. This means that the encryption key is actually in the SSD itself. Now. Uh, in theory, that should be unlocked by a password that you provide as a user, but uh, you know the data center becomes a bit harder than that. Anyways, we get that if the device is trusted by the system, you need we need to secure the device. Otherwise, the user data are uh, in the hands of anyone who could hack our SSD, right? So you need if uh, one. Uh, Let's say 960 terabytes disk contains a model that is worth $10 million. That disk is worth $10 million. Now try to imagine an attacker that was, wants to have a good return on investment on $10 million. Is willing to spend, for example, half million dollar on the attack and it will still be a good investment if he can get the model, right? Now we're talking about uh, crime here, so don't take my words as a recommendation for committing crimes. I'm just uh, speculating for uh, uh, deliver some ideas about uh, product security. The, the main idea is the fact that your attacker might have a lot of money, might be willing to spend a lot of money on hacking your target. Which means that, I mean, the ways in which you can hack that, a target, uh, um, they depend. So let me, let me switch to this. Basically, um, you, the different attacks that you can perform, you can attempt on a device have different costs. Uh, for example, the cheapest one are the software attacks. For software attacks, you just need to, uh, for example, intercept a firmware upgrade of, from, for a device uh, from the internet. Uh, those are publicly hosted there because uh, systems need to be updated. And you can start uh, reverse engineering that uh, and you can find a vulnerability. In that case, uh, you paid I mean, you can do that with zero budget because uh, we have a, uh, there exists, let's say, an open source uh, uh, decompiler, which is uh, a Ghidra by the NSA. So you can even get there without spending zero money. However, when your budget, when your attack budget increases, you can start to, you can get some other, let's say, more creative uh, attack attempts, uh, also more fun attack attempts. But this is uh, obviously uh, my perspective. For example, you could try a physical attack. What if uh, you um, pay someone to extract uh, from the data center the SSD that contains the model and bring it to you? I mean, you can do that. It has a cost. Um, so if you get physical presence, if you get your hands on the drive, there are a lot of different things you could do on that. For example, you could try to um, bypass the security measures using uh, invasive attacks, such as uh, fault injection. Uh, fault injection is a way in which uh, you uh, attack a device uh, by injecting a malfunction on the device itself while it is operating. For example, dropping the voltage to zero or shooting an impulse on that or shooting it with a laser. These are all different ways documented in the academia in which you can cause a malfunction on the, on the device. Actually, it's pretty easy to cause a malfunction because devices, you know, 
they work just because uh, engineers have spent a lot of effort in trying to make them stable. But you just have to change the environmental condition to bring them outside of the boundary which the electronic engineer have thought for these devices. For example, heating up a device might have an effect on its operation. And you want to be able to corrupt uh, the behavior of the device such that it is no longer able to maintain the security properties that uh, he was programmed with. And if an attacker is able to do that, he can force open the device, basically. Uh, there are other ways in which uh, you can at attack a device. For example, you can use a side channel analysis, which is a way in which you record uh, the power consumption of the device um, while it is processing a secret, while it is, uh, for example, encrypting using AES. And you use that data, the, the power consumption of the device, you, you can measure that. You hook up a multimeter to the device and you record that using, for example, an oscilloscope. Uh, that information is correlated with the secret inside the device because uh, the device uh, switches more or less transistor according to how the bits are stored in the secret. Because if it needs to do something with the secret, it needs to consume power in a way that is proportional to the secret in with some correlation, positive, negative, whatever. An attacker might be able to exploit that. He might be able to collect a lot of traces because in the end that information is present, but is very faint in such a trace. So an attacker wants to maximize the signal that is getting out of that uh, trace. So for doing that, he might be able to, for example, average over a large number of traces and try to extract correlation with the key. All of these attacks uh, are documented in the academia, and uh, they are also uh, very fun to play with, especially in academic environment. Uh, uh, if you're interested in something like that, uh, there are uh, lots of uh, research groups in the Polytechnic that are working on uh, uh, this kind of topics. If you are if you are interested, uh, let me know. And uh, but obviously. Mm, the role of my team becomes a lot trickier under this condition, right? Because we need to make sure that our devices are secure against, are reasonably secure against this kind of attack. We need to take the cost that it takes to attack a device and bring it up as much as possible. Because we want to discourage basically an attacker to we want an attacker to give up, to say, oh, it's too costly to attack this device. It's too costly uh, and my return on investment is not guaranteed. So um, let's talk about edge, uh, which includes, let's say, in a more broad uh, interpretation of the term, uh, industrial SSD and NANDs, uh, but also automotive devices. So. We are seeing in the latest years uh, the uh, rise of uh, electric vehicles, uh, the rise of um, uh, the more uh, vehicles uh, become uh, software um, driven, the more you get uh, features like uh, self driving capabilities, the more you get that your device needs to be trusted by the, the pilot, but it needs also to be trusted by the community because a car that uh, goes crazy while it's driving in autopilot mode might kill a pedestrian that is not even the owner of the car. Maybe he has not seen the car beforehand. So we have now considering a different, we are now considering a different environment where we still have a high stake, but it's a, a different one. It's not maybe the direct value of the data that's inside the drive, but maybe it comes from the safety, from the fact that um, someone might be interested to threaten, maybe to ransom, to give a, to, to put up a ransom. Uh, uh, they lock, like just like a, um, the ransomware uh, operator, they could lock people's car and ask them for money for, in case, for that to be unlocked, or they can just uh, maybe uh, be paid by some uh, nation state actor like an intelligence agency to, uh, to eliminate a target. Something like that um, 
is definitely implicit in the nature of a car, which is a very heavy, very powerful object that can move at high speed. So in this case, uh, the work of our team is, you know, uh, similar in the means, but very different in the scope, because for example, we need to go hand by hand with safety. We need to ensure that our the devices are compliant with uh, new rising standards like the ISO 21434, which is uh, is recent. Is basically uh, was recently re released and uh, describes the way in which you should document all the process of the security analysis of a device to make sure that uh, uh, the chance that uh, an attack, the device is subject to an attack, is minimized and also to make sure that in case something bad happened, you can understand what went wrong and you can fix it. So there are some uh, uh, rising regulations about uh, cybersecurity in automotive. And all of this is a very interesting challenge to try to secure automotive de devices and indirectly to increase the security of people on the road and of people driving cars. So it's a way in which one uh, could work on a product and have an, an impact on the world, making, you know, uh, making cars safer. Um, we also have, for example, uh, uh, another uh, environment, which is the PC, uh, in the sense of consumer PCs. In that case, uh, typically you have uh, a lower, uh, a devices devices we have uh, which have a lower cost, but still they need to be still resistant against the same attacks because we don't want uh, people to lose, for example, their data. If you are doing your thesis, you would not want your thesis to be stolen just because uh, your PC maybe it's, uh, gets infected by a malware and maybe the malware uh, attacks uh, or uses the SSD as their entry vector. So we don't want to do that. Or maybe an SSD could be an ally in that case. For example, an SSD that is able to detect whenever a ransom where is uh, rewriting all the data with uh, encrypted data. So whenever there is a high, uh, a spike, in, an increase in the entropy of the data, uh, it could at some point block the operation and it could save your data potentially from a, a ransomware. Something like that could be really helpful because it could have a direct impact on the uh, life of the end user. And also we have mobile. Um, Mobile, basically, it's another different uh, environment, even though mobile and automotive share some technology because they both, for example, use UFS uh, devices with uh, based on the UFS link. Um, but the threat model is completely different because uh, a mobile phone, for example, is something that is typically very, for an attacker, it's very easy to get their hands on your phone because um, people lose their phone. I bet that mm, at least 10 people in this room lost their phone at least once. So not only it's easy to steal something that is uh, the size of a phone because it's, it's small, but it's also, they are also easy to tear apart. Uh, most of the capability to perform a fault injection attack or uh, any other invasive attack on a mobile phone can be found in the usual repair stops. So there is one that I know that is basically in the middle of the ale of a mall. So literally in the middle, in, in the open air, in, in a place where you have uh, thousands of people going on and you just need, you know, uh, soldering iron microscope and whatever. But... Uh, the difficulty of the attack gets far, gets lower, and thus the challenge of securing the device gets more challenging just because the devices are so easy to obtain physically and to open and to try to break it. But still, a mobile phone, for most people, it's where they have their access to their bank, their access to all their social account, their access to their email, and uh, maybe all the pictures. Uh, so it's an incredibly valuable target for a person. Now, uh, you might wonder, but 
is there someone that is actively attacking me? I mean, what? why are they, I mean, why would they want to attack me? Now, um, there are cases in, in, the cases in which basically a single specific phone might be the target of an attack, but th those mostly are related to uh, nation state access, such as an uh, intelligence agency, which might want to uh, hack the device of one person. There, there, were, there were cases in, in, uh, documented in history where, uh, for example, the, um, uh, I don't remember the name, but basically there were cases where uh, journalists uh, were, uh, um, uh, were captured by, uh, by foreign forces because they hacked their devices. So um, a phone is also a giant tracker that you carry along with you. It has a GPS uh, antenna. It has a permanent data connection. So it's the last device you want to be hacked. Otherwise, uh, it will expose everything about you. Now, this is not to scare you. This is just to highlight the importance of uh, securing such devices. And uh, the critical thing is, for example, that Android devices from mid to low range, they trust the UFS storage because they trust the UFS storage with the pin unlock count of the sequence. They trust it with the signatures of the trust zone applets. So memory is really a trusted component in a lot of smartphones out there. Therefore, there's a high stake here and trying to make these devices more secure. And it's particularly challenging because these devices are actually have a very thin uh, margin. So they are, they cannot cost uh, $50 because the mobile phone otherwise would cost, let's say uh, $200 more because in the end, when you buy it, you get uh, some uh, multiplication factor by the OEM. So um, you have a very thin margin, but still you need to do what's best for the end customer. And this is, these are some of the challenges that we face in our team. Uh, in fact, our team uh, works uh, basically you know it's cross functional across all the teams so in in uh, the company we have uh, uh, teams dedicated to uh, each different products uh, and what uh, my team the product security team does uh, it interacts with all the engineer for all the with all the uh, of all the different products uh, and trying to help them raise the security level we cannot um, basically we can analyze a product, we can see where its fallacies might be, we can try some attacks, we can succeed or not in uh, obtaining these attacks. And the goal is to try to secure our devices, to break them eventually before other people do, and to put a mitigation in place so that we can stronger for example than uh, uh, other devices in the wild, we can we can be, you know, we can be strong and we can raise the security level of the whole application and of the end user. So um, we have a little bit of time left. Uh, uh, I wanted to show you an example, for example, of, uh, of what it means to uh, have a physical threat. So um, you all recognize the device here on the right, right? Uh, if you don't, uh, please raise your hand. I will explain what it is. But I, I suppose all of you have seen this device. There was an attack, um, uh, which uh, is uh, a recent work is uh, uh, was released less than one year ago, that is actually performed by uni uh, university, and they found a way to bypass Secure Boot on those devices using a glitch attack. So um, a fault injection attack, basically, they discovered that if you, first the device had the UART uh, ports open, and if you could cause a malfunction into the main processor during the boot sequence, it would think it's in, it's still in production mode, not in uh, shipment mode. So um, it will open all the debug ports for you. So you could access from JTAG the whole device and you can basically get the complete control over the device. So what's interesting, what I find interesting about this attack and that's why I wanted to show that to you, is that in this case, 
the attack was not you know just tried in the lab uh, on uh, on a single device okay it works uh, let's publish it but they took the effort to build a mod chip which is something that some of you might remember uh, from the piracy scene in consoles uh, if you owned a ps1 a ps2 uh, mod chips mod chips were available for those consoles so you could purchase one mod chip, uh, solder it in on the motherboard of your console, and you would have uh, a tiny device that reproducibly repeats the attack every time at every boot. Something like this shows uh, the, the fact that I talked about the, um, basically the scrap fault injection attacks uh, as if they were, they could cost uh, half a million dollars, but if you take a look at this device, this is the mod chip, and you can already tell, I mean, I can figure out the bill of material in my head. So this is the Raspberry Pi 2040, this is like cost a few dollars, and you have uh, a handful of passive components. You have a MOSFET, uh, this is cost a few cents. Uh, you have some, uh, some capacitors and uh, some, real estate of PCB on which to solder all of this. I mean, most of you could solder this board by hand. So in the end, an attack, maybe the tool needed to discover an attack faster can cost a lot of money. But in the end, an attack could be mounted on commodity technology. And therefore, you still need, when you evaluate the security uh, against a harder attack, you need to evaluate that an attacker might weaponize the attack or might try to optimize to cut down costs and to make it reproducible in a cheap way, such as uh, this mod chip here. Now, um, let me uh, leave um, the word to Chiara, which is uh, uh, part of the HR uh, in Micron that can uh, tell you more about what it means to be working at Micron. Please, Chiara. Thank you, Nicolo. Uh, I hope you can hear me. OK. Yes. Yes, so, we can. Thank you. Thank you for feedback. Uh, I do not want to steal too much time to <laughs> question and answer a lot. So just quickly, if you can go uh, to the next page. Thank you. So as Nicolo mentioned, uh, working at Micron is uh, means to uh, face a, a huge amount of challenging activities in a challenging market. And for this reason, we do have tons of functions that are working, uh, let's say, in a connected and coordinated manner uh, on uh, uh, several products, uh, to, like Gears. So uh, I do not want to focus on the roles uh, because, uh, uh, I mean, <laughs> this is uh, focused on cybersecurity. So uh, the essential thing here is that collaboration is really a key, uh, is the engine that moves all of those gears. And uh, um, also, uh, if you move uh, next. Yeah, sure. Okay. So just to give you a quick snapshot of the career opportunities that can be built at Micron. So basically we have two ways of developing our career. One is in the uh, technical ladder, meaning that uh, the career progression is built upon uh, the uh, technical expertise which become deeper and deeper over the years. And the other one is the more classical managerial growth. Um, but uh, uh, the elements that are underlying to this uh, career opportunities are this uh, strong uh, attitude to uh, have enthusiasm. And Nicola was also uh, showcasing <laughs> kind of enthusiasm in this job. Uh, obviously, problem solving, team working, and uh, most of all, the ability to um, uh, be, let's say, problem, solver, problem solvers and have um, an innovation approach and the attitude to think out of the box. We have several uh, paths to support this kind of skills and uh, also in the daily conversations with colleagues, but we also have structured the, um, 
trainings and mentoring opportunities and uh, several nice things. So definitely, uh, which is our ideal candidate if you go to the next slide, um, please. So the ideal candidate is, I mean, someone who really wants to uh, get involved and bring their unique talent to the company. Uh, you are all uh, engineers, so or you will be soon engineers. So uh, no doubt that uh, you have a solid uh, background in terms of hard skills. So just bring your enthusiasm and uh, unicity in the uh, conversation with Micron when you look for uh, a job here. So if you have uh, then any specific question on uh, HR related or career, just please uh, let me know. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. And uh, as well for the for the technical part, if you if you have uh, any question, uh, uh, we I can answer uh, at those. Uh, I mean, I can try to answer now, or eventually, um, I think you can. Uh, uh, maybe also leave me uh, an email. Uh, uh, Lorenzo, I would give back the word to you. Yes, thank you, Nicola. Thank you for your uh, talk. It was very interesting. I have some question actually, uh, but first I would like maybe someone uh, from the chat, uh, someone that is following. You can write the, the, the question or you can also turn on the mic and answer directly. Yeah, and uh, ask the question directly, sorry. Don't be shy. Okay, we have one question. Davide, uh, for the HR, what's, what are the most important things that you're looking for during an interview for you? Uh, I have a uh, young employee. Sorry, uh, yeah, I have something uh, on the on the word. Okay, uh, okay. The most important thing, uh, let's say that it's. I understand it's a bit generic, but is that the person is fitting the position, which is for sure. Um, let's say starting from an evaluation of the skills that. Uh, the candidate is bringing so for a position that requires to be able to program in a kind of language for sure we need to assess that we do have this competence just an example but also that the uh, attitude the approach is uh, um, let's say in the framework i mentioned before uh, and uh, the, that the uh, I wouldn't say personality, rather the, the overall attitude is uh, uh, fitting into the team where the person is going to uh, enter. Uh, so the essential thing is that uh, I mean, we are pretty uh, open. We, we are setting our interviews as an open conversation. And when it comes to HR, we are really uh, we want to understand motivation and aspiration of the uh, candidate just to make sure that we get the best fit, uh, not just of a candidate for the position, but also of the position for a candidate. I don't know if this answer, but I mean, it depends on the position then, really. Okay. I think that answered actually. Uh, I have a question for uh, for uh, Nicolo. Sure. Uh, you, you talked about uh, AI and uh, the fact that today we have AI as a service because basically mm -hmm. you you get a pre pre-trained model and you fine tune and then you use it. Now, OpenAI has also a possibility to rent to other people, so that would imply that even more people are interested in uh, low la uh, large language model as a service. Mm -hmm. um, but you talk about, okay, uh, we would like to have these models on our uh, on our phone. 
And my question for you is, uh, when the task is very, actually, uh, it's an art task, like uh, uh, reading a paper or reading something and query the, the, the model uh, um, regard, uh, regarding the content of the paper of the, of the, or the document, uh, this is something that can be achieved only through a very uh, large language model. Sorry for the for the for the game of uh, words, uh, but how can you? How do you think it will uh, it will go in the future? Like we will have these kind of models on our phones, or we will have some sort of uh, reduction. We will have. So um, now that's a, an interesting question. So first of all, I I took AI as an example. I'm not an expert yeah, in course. AI. So, uh, but uh, my my what I think about this is that if a task will remain too big to fit the cap computational capabilities of a mobile device, we can still keep it in the, the, the data center. However, there are some emerging technologies that allow you allows you to perform um, confidential computation on a data center. Okay. For example, uh, AMD is uh, has already rolled out uh, what is called uh, SCV SMP, or uh, Intel is uh, rolling out uh, uh, an equivalent uh, version of it. So there are ways in which you can uh, get access to uh, an encrypted VM, so a virtual machine that has encrypted SRAM, uh, sorry, encrypted um, uh, DRAM, okay. and only the final user possess the cryptographic key that encrypts the DRAM. So um, this is nice because uh, if even if the attacker had root capabilities on the hypervisor itself, he could not decrypt the, the DM itself. You need to trust, obviously, the, the vendor of the SOC. You need to trust Intel or AMD and their uh, embedded firmware like Intel ME or AMD. Uh, but I think that could be a way so to further expand uh, all of these engineering uh, cases where uh, you can, uh, uh, for example, uh, get uh, an on-demand uh, encrypted VM and upload the computation there and then get the result. And uh, all of the, in those cases, uh, uh, micro memories play a role as well because uh, this uh, protocol typically trust the storage itself because they want to offload the encryption of the memory to, for example, a CXL device. And it's important for uh, uh, Micron to make a device that is secure so that uh, with the assumption that we made that uh, only uh, the end user can access his data stays true. Seems a reasonable assumption, of course. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank we have another question. we have another question from Ray. Uh, how can you secure a physical memory acting, for example, on a firmware on the controller, or by also designing a secure silicon? So thank you for the. This is a very interesting question, and the answer is both. So typically, when you want to implement a mitigation let's say let's take for example fault injection mitigation but this is as a uh, reflex uh, in all the uh, physical threats uh, you typically have uh, both hardware and software mitigations and uh, you want to consider both uh, why because uh, manufacturing uh, silicon takes a lot of time an awfully lot of time just the the manufacturing itself so when from the grain of sand to the final device shipping in its box it takes almost a year just because you have to create the silicon you have a ton of like a lot of steps that the silicon has to pass like you create the the bowl you slice it into wafer you have to process the wafer with different steps and you have to wait between those steps so just the the bare production of the device takes a lot of time. If you add in the development and the engineering of a device, you end up with the fact that when you work on a device, for example, if you want to influence, if you want to change the hardware, you will be able to do so only on the device that will get in the market in three years. So if you want to fix your problem before that time, you need to start with 
software mitigation, which sometimes they are the less effective. Sometimes they have a hit on performance. They are not, typically they are less efficient and I would say less effective than uh, hardware mitigation, but you can roll them out immediately with uh, a firmware update. So both strategies need to be taken into account. And typically um, when you work in micro and in product security, you can, you have uh, all the products that are in flight in different stages. You have some products that are end of life, someone that are really already released on the market, someone that are released, uh, you know, in uh, one, uh, in six months. So they are feature freezed, uh, someone that will release in three years. And for every, uh, position in the production pipeline, you need to adapt the way in which you influence the device in terms of uh, computer security. Because uh, um, for every position in this production pipeline, you have different possibilities. And I hope you, you I answered your question. Okay, I see I'm seeing another question. Mm -hmm. Uh, does playing CTF and learn cybersecurity stuff on platforms such as uh, Triacme, Act the Box helps finding a job as a penetration tester, red teaming, especially for a student with no experience in, in working? I would say yes, because uh, uh, learn, uh, playing CTF uh, teaches you, I mean, you need to see it as still as a practice. So when you um, CTFs are engineered to be solvable by human in a reasonable time. When you, when you, what changes when you work on a real device is that uh, the real device is not engineered to be hackable, <laughs> supposedly. <laughs> Otherwise, it would be a backdoor, a backdoor device, and that is bad. So, in general, what changes is that uh, you need to grow in on the work the sensitivity on what is the right path to perform your task, what is the easiest path to attack? That's the only change. You don't have the guarantee that the challenge is solvable. Nonetheless, uh, practicing uh, with a CTF uh, allows you to learn a lot of different skills from reverse engineering uh, to crypto to forensics. Uh, all this stuff, uh, you learn it in the CDF and maybe you know five years later you are working at Micron and you remember about that challenge and somehow you are finding something that is similar and you can reuse the knowledge you gain. So I would say that is uh, helpful. It's not complete, of, of course, but it's helpful. But um, CTF, playing CTF is not the only way. I would say that uh, the best uh, training grounds uh, uh, is uh, to try and hack whatever lies uh, around you in your home, for example. You you have uh, your, uh, I don't know, uh, for fun, uh, I, I hacked uh, some Chinese radio devices now. They are getting censored by the <laughs> uh, Zoom filter, which is good for me. But um, basically, uh, I had some practice uh, uh, hacking some uh, commercial devices and uh, in general, when you hack a device that is not uh, incredibly famous, uh, like uh, wanting to hack an iPhone, maybe it's very hard because, you know, you get a lot of people uh, looking into that. So they had 15 years of experience in hardening the device. But when you, for example, target an IoT device or some other uh, embedded device that uh, is not uh, so well known, typically it will be fairly easy to be hacked uh, because uh, companies uh, do not naturally tend to secure their devices beforehand because it's costly for them. I mean, it, it's it's a cost for a company to make their device secure. So I would recommend you to to be curious, to try to, to hack what you have around, to, to learn about uh, uh, the way in which uh, devices are hacked. For example, uh, the console hacking scene is very funny. There is the, the failover flow team that uh, worked a lot on the PS4. They hacked the hell out of this console. They hacked everything, including the embedded controller that drives the PS4 controller. So um, reading right up and trying to, to learn how different devices can be hacked, uh, it's, it's a good uh, training ground because uh, it, you know, it primes you with uh, all of those background techniques that 
give you the sense about what are the different strategies to hack a device, what is the difficulty of each strategy. And uh, this is, I think, the way you can uh, prepare best to uh, a penetration testing job, uh, let's say a product security job in Micron. Thank you for your question. Okay. Uh, I have a last one. Uh, mm -hmm. If anybody else doesn't want to actually uh, uh, make a question, um, I was. Uh, you show us before the the exploit on the on on the glitch. Uh, uh, on yes, this one. Uh, a lot of actually uh, boards have this kind of problem because uh, as soon as you try a, a fault injection or also with photons, some people use photons to change the value of a comparison in the in the, in the firmware, and then you go in a in a flow that is basically debug mode, and then you can control the the device. My question is. Uh, a lot of vendor, including ST, uh, do have uh, a readout protection or some sort of uh, defense that is still software and basically uh, disable completely the, 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 the debug interface, the JTAG, but it's software. So you can actually change the value of this configuration and it's okay. You cannot do it. Uh, by by a programming interface, but if you wall glitch, you you can. Mm. My question is, how uh, unrealistic is to uh, make a a um, a chip a board that doesn't have a debug interface at all? Mm. So this is a it's a good question, and uh, it's something I can. Uh, um, so I I. I witnessed this, this discussion on <laughs> all many products. Okay. <laughs> and uh, um, the problem is that you have uh, two opposing uh, desires. So product security engineer want to see the bug interfaces disappear. They want to see a device that has uh, the minimum possible interface and everything is, you know, uh, there are no memory errors and you get a uh, uh, protocol, a protocol that is formally verified. This is their desiderata. But on the other side, you get uh, all the field engineers, all the people that work on RMAs, whenever a device uh, um, misbehaves in the field, typically uh, once the OEM uh, is able to, uh, let's say, let's make a practical example. There is a car that uh, reboots itself. Uh, the manufacturer of the car will go take the, you know, perform a recall of the car, so give a new car to the user, and then it will take the ECU of the car, will analyze it themselves. Maybe they realize that it's the fault of the Micron device. So they will ship the entire ECU to Micron, and Micron needs to understand what is going on. Of now, course. at this point, you can see that... Uh, you want to have the opposite. So you, you would want to have a device in which you can really have everything open. You can look at every single bit because it, that will make your, uh, basically your time to uh, analyze an RMA reduced by a lot. So here there are opposing factors. Now, this is uh, actually something that can be, uh, that has a, let's say a reasonable trade-off. So, I would say that the best way is not to eliminate the debug ports because otherwise uh, the device uh, uh, becomes also less repairable. So you, you need to throw it away and buy a new one. And you would never know what, what was broken. So yes, you would, that's actually the point, would, I guess. It's, it's not easy to fix the problem on all the other products. So, um, and that's a, a money issue. However, you can have debug ports the whole point is to secure them properly. So to have a hardware mechanism that disables them. And eventually it needs to be over, it can be overwritten, for example, by a previous authentication. 
but it needs to be implemented properly. As you can see, as you said, if you do that in software, you can still glitch past that most of the time. However, you can place some hardware components that, for example, enforces that. And uh, um, here, basically, uh, the recommendation from NIST, uh, which I think it's reasonable, uh, it's, I don't know if you are, some of you are familiar with the DICE specification, like DICE. Um, that tells you that if you go from locked state to unlocked, the identity of your device should change. So you should okay. be able to erase all the user data before you can do that switch. Because in the end, the RMA, you know, uh, the return analysis process, uh, they might give up on user data. Maybe the user data is actually causing the fault, but it is, is a trade-off, you know, we are kind of uh, rolling out. And just, for example, deleting all the valuable assets that, that are on the device when unlocking could be a reasonable solution because in the end the device is unlocked, but there's no, but nothing there to be, to be found. But still, then you need to ensure that everything is deleted properly. You know, uh, it's uh, it's still uh, it's not a, a, a easy not, task. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not giving you you know the perfect solution. This is a, an interesting engineering problem, and uh, you will always need uh, debug ports. But uh, there, I mean. Actually, it's an, an interesting uh, problem in how to properly secure them. And there are strategies, especially if, like Micron, you control the hardware. Because uh, you can actually design some mechanism that lets you do that. OK. Thank you very much uh, for your answer again. And uh, I don't see any other question. And I think we are a bit, a bit late in time. So uh, if there are no more questions, I would say that uh, for today is everything. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nicolò and Chiara. Thank you, thank for, you for being here. Attended. Thank you, everyone. And uh, I wish you all a uh, uh, good uh, evening and a uh, good weekend. So I'll see you next uh, next Friday. Thank you, Lorenzo. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.